years of law enforcement, two things have never ceased to amaze me. Number one, there are no laws a criminal will not stoop to in order to come out on top. And number two, even the most seemingly peaceful situations have the potential to explode into violence. My most recent example of this is February of 2020, right before the Rona hit, when I was working on a pet recovery PI job. I served almost 20 years at the Oakland PD and I've been working private investigations for the last three. But if you think being a PI was a step down in intensity from actual police work, you'd be wrong. But don't worry, because that'd make two of us. I thought being a PI would be an easy way to pad my bank account so I'd still have something left over for the kids. Turns out, it's all the grind of a detective's job and the perps are even less afraid to point a gun at you. But work is work, so I stuck with it. Anyway, back to the pet recovery job, something that became my bread and butter for a few months back in 2019 and 2020. You might be surprised how willing people were to steal each other's dogs, and even weirder was how a rare crime like dog napping experienced a huge spike. It was mainly thoroughbred pups being stolen, but there were definitely a few cases where a mutt was passed off as a pedigree and that basically meant that no dog was safe. So, I get a call from this nice, polite, elderly couple who tell me their brand new French bulldog pup had been stolen. If an animal gets stolen, finding them is easy and it's usually an issue that uniformed cops can deal with. If not, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And due to the large amount of dog nappings, us private investigators got to soak up the overflow. So, I take down all the details of the robbery, get a photo of the dog, then hit up the likes of Facebook Marketplace to see if there are any French bulldog pups for sale. I didn't get one right away, but about a week later, I see a listing for a one-year-old French bulldog pup at some rock-bottom price. Now, I'd worked dog nappings before, so... I was already somewhat familiar with the dog napper's mindset. They'll always give out some terrible excuse as to why they're selling, like how they just can't afford to feed the dog anymore or that they're moving to an apartment that doesn't allow animals. But then, when you ask to meet in a public place, say a dog park, they suddenly can become very insistent that the exchange takes place at a private residence or in a suspiciously private location. And bingo. When I ask the seller to meet at a nearby dog park, they give me some excuse about being disabled and ask me to meet them at their home. I was 90% sure at this point that this was my guy, and my usual game plan was just to roll up and explain that it was either me or cops and cuffs. This was usually all it took. After all, people who prey on tiny dogs and elderly couples tend not to be so brave or tough. Anyway... Later that day, I roll up to the guy's house, knock on the door, and tell him that I'm there for the dog when he opens up. He brings the dog out on a leash, and I can tell right away that it's the exact same dog I'm looking for. It's gray with white patches, these bright green eyes, just about the cutest looking thing you'd ever seen. The guy's right in the middle of apologizing for having lost the dog's vax papers while assuring me it's had its shots, when I straight up just say the dog's name. The guy had been calling him some other name and I noticed the dog didn't seem to be responding to it, but when I called it Oscar, what its owner's been calling it for the first year of its life, the dog literally perks up and cocks its head as if to say, do I know you sir? Immediately the dog napper senses something's wrong, but at the same time he's totally committed to making the sale, so instead of just telling me to get lost and going back inside, he responds by saying, you want the dog or not, man? I tell him no, and I know a couple of old folks who'd be very interested in being united with their beloved Oscar. It was a total bluff, like I said. I was only 90% sure it was the dog I was looking for, maybe only 95% after the dog responded to its name. But then came what I can only describe as an impressively convincing performance from the dog napper in question. The guy was completely indignant, told me he knew what I was implying and that he had the paperwork to prove it was his dog. If I just wait a minute, he'd go fetch it and then I'd owe him an apology. 
It got to the point where I really started to doubt myself. Anyone else would have given up the act by this point. But here was this guy, throwing my bluff right back at me with finesse, to the point that I actually just stood there like an idiot, waiting for him to bring back some papers that didn't exist in the first place. A minute later, he re-emerges, and I have expected him to actually have the papers. But no, I instinctively reacted as he swung at me, and in the millisecond that his fist flew past my face, I saw he had something shiny in his hand. I kept on backing up, hand moving toward my holster, and the next thing I know, he's running back into his house as I have my pistol pointed at him. If I'd have been an inch closer to that guy's door, I'd have been a dead man. I called it in, and since I still had a few connections to the department, I managed to get a squad car out to me pretty fast. The guy had like 25 dogs in the back room of his place, all stolen, all kept in some of the most inhumane conditions imaginable. What I thought was going to be an afternoon's work turned out to be a huge thing. With animal welfare and a few CSP officers joining the circus of vehicles parked outside the house, Oscar was eventually returned to his owners and the perp eventually agreed to a plea deal which involved returning the rest of the dogs to their owners. It didn't end well for all of them though. Some of the dogs had already been sold on, so not all of them were able to be returned. The impact it had on people was horrendous too. Like if you think people get upset over a stolen TV, just imagine how they get when they actually love the thing that's being stolen. Almost makes you feel bad taking people's money when it works out like that, but you gotta put food on the table somehow. It just helps when doing the right thing is what brings home the bacon. I've been meaning to send you my brother's story for a while now, but writing this turned out to be much harder than I first thought. I lost my brother a few years back. He was a cop for most of his life, but took an early medical retirement after being stabbed almost 20 times while on a traffic stop. According to him, the guy played drunk as a skunk so he could get close enough to pull his knife, and then managed to almost turn my brother into a pincushion before he could defend himself. I don't think he ever really had to work again, but he also wasn't ready to completely retire, age just 41, so he took up private investigator work with a small firm outside Sacramento. Not exactly adrenaline-fueled run-and-gun stuff, but it was enough to feather his nest egg while keeping idle hands from the devil's work. Anyway, the last job he ever took was something pretty close to his heart. According to his old boss, the company had been tasked with tracking down a former cop, one who had a bizarrely similar story to my brother's. He too had been handed an early medical retirement after a traffic stop gone wrong, but the incident was considerably worse than the one experienced by my brother. Not only had this guy lost his patrol partner in the shootout that followed, he coded multiple times from his own wounds that left him with a complex form of post-traumatic stress disorder. He'd gone through an identical therapy program to my brother, it just hadn't worked for him like it worked for Marty. I think that's what affected Marty so greatly about it. How in his mind it could have just as easily been him losing his mind and vanishing, all the while scaring the life out of his family in the process. So, from what I heard, Marty spent a lot of time or so tracking the guy down. How in God's name he managed it when law enforcement had been unable to, I'm not quite sure, but he must have gone out to have a face-to-face -face with the guy around September because that's around the time that he stopped answering his phone. Marty used to get pretty absorbed in his work, so it wasn't all that unusual not to hear from him for a few days at a time. Back when my sister-in-law called to tell us that he hadn't reached out to her either, that was when we started to worry. The guy he was looking for might have gone off the grid, but Marty always had his cell on him while he was working. All it took for the cops to find him was to ping his phone, then bingo, they found his body. Marty had been killed by a rigged shotgun shell that someone had strung up in a tree. The cops think it was the guy he was looking for, but it could have just as easily been someone with him. 
They'd rig their dirty redneck shack with booby traps and all over the surrounding woods too. It's actually something of a miracle that Marty went up there on his own. A lot more lives might have been lost otherwise. That's how I rationalize it to myself anyways. That even in death he was out there saving lives and protecting people. I just don't get what would drive someone to booby trap their home like that. Like what are you so scared of that you need to rig shotgun shells to trip wires or whatever he was doing? As far as I know, he hadn't actually done anything wrong, so the cops weren't looking for him outside of being listed as a missing person. I totally get that he was suffering with mental health problems and that he wasn't exactly behaving in a rational way. But what if he wasn't as crazy as people were making him out to be? What if he was actually being pursued by people that warranted such a level of defense and precaution? Look, I'm not excusing the role the guy played in the death of my brother, but after all the sadness and anger and hatred has passed, all I have left is unanswered questions. Obviously, the guy caught a charge for death by reckless endangerment, but the cops think he either heard the shell going off where he found Marty's body because he got out of that area not long after. I know Marty was dealing with something big. He wouldn't have been so obsessed with the case otherwise. He had a rough idea of the guy's location. Why not just pass that on to the family? And this is in the age of drone technology too, something I know Marty was a fan of. So why bother hiking all the way out there when he could have just gotten a few drone pictures. Marty was easily the toughest person I ever knew and he was like that ever since we were kids. He was crazy brave but he was crazy smart too and I don't believe he'd ever put himself at risk unless he absolutely had to. The whole thing just doesn't sit right with me and maybe it's just the way the grief manifests now but I can't help but think that something much darker was going on than just some traumatized ex-cop. Worst thing is, I don't think any of us are going to get any solid answers until they catch the guy, which between you and me, could well be never. I'm sorry this doesn't have some grand conclusion or whatever, lord knows I wish it did too, but to me, this is a horror that I've learned to live with on a daily basis that my brother is gone, and there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to it at all. And of all the weird jobs I've worked as a private investigator, there's one that tops the list when it comes to weird, creepy calls. I knew right away that it wasn't going to be your average Monday as soon as the client mentioned an old clock. It had been in the client's family for a few generations and was obviously a very important heirloom, so the client wanted to know more about it. Only trouble was, they had no idea where to start, so their logic was, why struggle as amateurs when we can pay a professional? Thankfully, I rely on that kind of thinking to keep my lights on, so even though the job was a little out of left field, I was grateful for the work. The shift from professional to personal curiosity occurred when I actually laid eyes on the thing for the first time. I've never been into antiques or watches or anything like that. Cars have always been more my thing, but, but let me tell you. Before we knew anything about it, that old clock was something to behold. It was about the same size as a toaster, perhaps not too small, not too big, but the work that had been put into it was seriously breathtaking. It looked as old as it was pretty too. I'm talking ancient in appearance, and even though the owner said it was made in the 1800s, it looked way, way older, like it might fall apart in your hands. But in spite of that, it was actually surprisingly sturdy and seemed to be made of a pale kind of wood, maybe a kind of maple that had been treated with something to make it almost bright white. I couldn't even begin to describe how incredibly intricate the inlay of the clock face was with all this ivory and pearl, or rather, I assumed was ivory and pearl. The owner mentioned that it might have come from over in Europe around the same time their family did. They were German and Czech, and since I factored lab fees into my pricing package, 
I just took the old clock to my lab guy to run a few tests on it. That kind of analysis is very expensive, but my guy told me that with the tests he'd be running, he'd be able to tell me exactly where the wood came from, along with a rough idea of when it was cut down. It's pretty impressive, right? And he says he can do all that from just a scraping of the wood. So much it won't affect the integrity of the clock's facade. It's an incredibly technological method with incredibly accurate results, but boy does it take time. So after my guy got a sample of the wood, he said that he'd get back to me probably in about a week. He calls me up two days later and tells me that it's not wood at all. It's bone. Human bone. Not just that. Almost every single part of the clock consisted of some variety of human anatomy. Remember the ivory and pearl I was telling you about earlier? Teeth. Human teeth. With some of the more delicate parts of the clock being made of a combo of human hair and fingernail fibers. Now, this put me in the unenviable position of having to tell the client that I was going to call the cops. There's a criminality clause in all my contracts, meaning that if some aspect of my work leans on to the wrong side of the law, I have the right to absolve myself of all criminal responsibility by going directly to the police to fill them in on what's going on. I've only ever had to do that once before, and it involved a case that's frankly not fit for discussion here. But through an investigation, I'd basically made myself an accessory to kidnap and murder, and let me tell you, that was a scary time for me. Anyway, I informed the client of my intentions and they were fine with it. They were just as shocked as I was to hear that the clock's casing was made of human bone. Compressed human bone, I should add. Looked a lot different than just regular old ribs or wing bones. So naturally, they were keen to absolve themselves of any guilt too. After that... It was just a case of heading down to the local PD to turn the clock in, because at that point, it was less of a case of where the clock came from and more who it came from. Ironically, the clock got sent right back to my lab buddy's place of work, because he texted me saying, guess who's reunited with your bone clock? This gave us something of a chuckle, but it was also one heck of a boon. If the cops were intent on keeping us in the dark, we'd have a way of knowing what was going on. A few days later, I get a call from my lab guy saying all the tests have been run and there's no DNA to match any profile at the CODIS or at the National DNA Index System. In fact, the guys at the lab figured whoever the bones had belonged to had died before America was even a country. So, unless my client had a time machine, it was safe to say that they were innocent of any foul play. After that, the cops were at something of a crossroads. Apparently, they could have gone ahead with charges, something about an old federal statute regulating the transportation of human tissues, but since there didn't seem to be any ill will or shadiness with my client, no charges were filed. But then it was a case of what to do with the remains, and officially speaking, my client was basically this dead person's legal guardian. They had to decide whether to just take the clock home again, or if they wanted the remains cremated and interred as a John Doe at a nearby cemetery. Personally, there was definitely a time in my life when I'd have thought, forget it, take the clock home and put it on eBay for antiques. Something like that has to exist, right? After all, human remains are not, and at the risk of sounding like Indiana Jones, that thing really should have been in some kind of museum or something. But the way my client saw it, either the bones belonged to an ancestor of theirs, in which case they should be laid to rest, or the bones weren't anything to do with the family, in which case they still deserve to be laid to rest. I think that was most definitely the right decision. All greed aside, I wouldn't want my remains passed around and ogled at as some piece of curios. So, that was that. The bone clock was cremated and interred under the name John Doe, and for all intents and purposes, the case was solved. The only thing that's left to wonder is 
how the heck the bone clock was created in the first place. Honestly, I'm hoping it was some dying clockmaker's last wish, to have his body refashioned into something that'd last for three or four lifetimes. And if that was the case, he sure did get his wish, for a while anyway. But then there's the much weirder thoughts that creep in when I let my mind take over. Because what if this guy wasn't dying when they took his bones? What if the whole thing was to turn a perfectly healthy person into a godforsaken clock? Maybe it was a punishment. Maybe it was like a ritual or something that was performed against their will. I'd rather not consider the second option. In fact, I try not to think about the bone clock too much at all. Because every time I do, that same old thought creeps into my head. Now the chimes that clock must have made at some point were less like chimes and more like screams. My parents hired a private eye to track down my sister, who'd run off with her much older boyfriend. It turned out to be one of the biggest mistakes they'd ever made. She was just 18 at the time, legally an adult, so as much as my mom and dad begged the cops to bring her home, there wasn't a darn thing that they could do about it. So, that's where the P.I. came into it. I was pretty young at the time this all went down, so my only real memory of the whole thing was when the cops showed up on our doorstep and my mom started wailing when they gave her the news. The private investigator pulled up to the apartment he thought my sister and her boyfriend were at. He was supposed to just contact our parents once he'd done this, but the cops figured he wanted to make a positive ID, so he walks right up to the room and knocks on the door. No one knows exactly what happened next. Even after watching the security camera footage, the cops couldn't quite tell who drew or shot first. But someone did, and once it started, that was it. My sister's boyfriend had a revolver, but... The private investigator had 17 rounds in his clips, so six bullets went one way, but 17 went the other. When it was over, the PI was dead, the boyfriend was dead, and the cops found my sister in the bathroom. She'd taken one in the arm and one in the neck. She lasted until the hospital, but coded when they were trying to stabilize her. Not long after that, I woke up to the sound of my mom screaming with the blue and red flashing lights outside. I had a thing about emergency lights for a long time after that, and they still give me a little zap of anxiety whenever I see them, because I always think that wherever they're going, there's someone screaming, just like my mom did. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Werner, I sincerely hope this email finds you well, but I'm afraid I have some bad news regarding the disappearance of your daughter. As per my last email, and thanks to the information you've already accumulated, I tracked Wendy down to Washoe County, Nevada. It seems you were correct in your assumption that she is traveling with others, although Topeka PD may have been correct in their assertion that she is in their company of her own free will. I know you firmly insisted on multiple occasions that your daughter was kidnapped, but I'm not ruling out that her previous statement wasn't coerced or made under duress, but some further details have come to light that you may wish to consider before continuing your efforts to bring Wendy back home. I understand that the past year has been very upsetting for you, and that all you desire is your daughter return to you, but at this stage of the investigation I think the priority should be minimizing the distress of all parties. So, while this is not strictly a plea to discontinue the investigation, I implore you to consider for the sake of your collective sanity. Based on communications with the Topeka Police Department, I managed to determine both the description of the vehicle she was traveling in as well as those of her companions. After that, it was simply a case of tracking her phone's cell data until I had a rough idea of where she was which turned out to be a small town named Sutcliffe on the western shores of Pyramid Lake. I understand that I'm not the first private investigator that you've employed, 
and that Wendy had reacted poorly to them in the past, so I made sure not to reveal my presence until it was absolutely necessary. I had the vehicles in sight, a girl matching Wendy's rough description. All I had to do was make a positive identification. I even had that recent picture you provided me with, just as a visual reference for when contact finally occurred, and the girl in question was even wearing the same hiking boots that Wendy left Ohio with, and I was 99% sure it was her. But when I tried to make contact, I began to notice certain anomalies. Wendy doesn't respond to her name anymore and doesn't seem to be an act of defiance. In my experience, it takes a long, long time, sometimes years for someone to rewire their brain when it comes to their birth name. So for Wendy to be visibly confused when I called her her birth name, that's something I've never experienced before. It's worth noting that she and her companions insisted that her name was Chantico. I'm unsure if this name has any significance to you, but the choice might provide an insight into her thought process and motivations, or that of her companions. As far as I can tell, the name is Central American of origin, but that is pure speculation on my part, as I am certainly no linguistics expert. You also told me that Wendy's height was just above 5'1", but the girl I spoke to wasn't an inch below 5'5 five five or 5'6". My own daughter is 5'6", and Wendy now appears to be a very similar height. I can assure you that this was not due to any kind of misidentification on my part, nor was Wendy wearing any kind of height-elevating hairstyle or footwear. She was wearing the same hiking boots she left Ohio with. There are only a handful of explanations for how this could be the case, and some are considerably more feasible than others, but instead of speculating, I think I'd be more prudent of me to respect the limits of my own knowledge as not to further confuse the investigation. As per our communication on May 24th, 2013, you told me Wendy's eyes were blue. Yet she seems to have suffered some kind of optical infection as the iris and pupil of her right eye had turned black. I understand there are contact lenses you can buy that achieve a similar effect, so this might not be anything to worry about. It's also possible that her right pupil was extremely dilated during the interaction which gave me the impression her eye had changed color. I'm not an optometrist, so I'm not trying to draw any conclusions from that. I only mentioned it in case it becomes pertinent later on. You also informed me that Wendy could be identified by the small pink heart-shaped tattoo on her wrist. In the end, this is the only real way of me knowing it was the same girl. She had the tattoo covered up with a bandage, but whether or not the tattoo is in the process of removal or she's simply covering it up, I'm not sure. I'd have made a solid ID attempt to gain visual of the tattoo, but like you warned me, my attempt at contact was immediately met with hostile response. As such, contact was broken immediately and I removed myself to a safe, observational distance. The last I saw of Wendy and her group, they were heading up into the mountains, on the roads towards Granite Peak. They may still be in Nevada, but there's just likely a chance that they cross state lines into California following their departure from Sutcliffe. If you wish to continue your investigation, you're obviously free to do so, but I'm afraid it will be without my participation. Frankly, I don't believe this is a case that I'm qualified to be involved in, although exactly whose expertise you'd wish to seek, I'm afraid I can't say. It seems impossible to even consider, but it seems on top of the drastic emotional changes Wendy has endured that there have been some sort of physical changes too. There might well be rational explanations for this, but as I previously stated, they are not explanations I feel I'm qualified to give. Mr. and Mrs. Werner, in all my years of law enforcement and detective work, I've only ever come across two cases that have truly, genuinely frightened me, and this is one of them. I understand that all you want is to have Wendy home again, and I say this not to alarm you, but to give you a realistic expectation of what might occur in the future, but I think you're overestimating just how much of Wendy you'd be getting back. This is the first time in my investigative career that I have ever had to do this, and please believe that I do so with a heavy heart, but I implore you to stop looking for Wendy, 
I fear you're chasing answers that few people are equipped to deal with, and having gotten to know you both personally over the past few months, it pains me to think that you're trying to endure the unendurable. Good luck, and I hope you both find peace in the future. Apologetically yours, Robert Clancy, Senior Associate, Taylor Payton Investigations, Kansas City, Missouri. In the early hours of June 7th, 1998, a brutal home invasion in Barberton, Ohio sent shockwaves across Middle America. 58-year-old Judy Johnson and her grandniece, 6-year-old Brooke Sutton, had been attacked by the violent intruder while they'd been sleeping. Judy had been sleeping on the TV room couch at the time, allowing the intruder to ambush her with a horrifyingly bloodthirsty attack. It only ceased once he'd strangled the life out of her. But in turn, the commotion had woken up six-year-old Brooke, who was nothing short of traumatized by what she saw. I got out of bed, went to the kitchen. Then when I looked, I saw that there was a guy in the kitchen, Brooke later said. But it scared me, so I ran back to the bedroom. Brooke then said that she hid under her duvet, pretending to be asleep, but her ruse didn't save her from the evil that had forced its way into her home that night. The mysterious intruder entered the bedroom and struck Brooke in the face. Once she was unconscious, Brooke was continually beaten, suffering a small cut to her throat in the process. This is believed to be from her attacker intending to kill her, yet going through a change of heart at the very final moment. By some miracle, Brooke survived an attack so horrendous that she'd had to compartmentalize it in order to preserve her mental health. Essentially, she had no memory of the attack, and awoke around seven hours after the attack to discover that her great-aunt's lifeless corpse was still laying on the couch where she'd been sleeping. Not knowing what to do, Brooke telephoned a neighbor, leaving the following message on one of their answering machines. I'm sorry to tell you this, but my grandma died, and I need somebody to get my mom for me. I'm all alone. Somebody killed my grandma. Now please... Would you get a hold of me as soon as you can? Bye. Brooke then walked to the home of neighbor Tanya Brazel, who told the bruised and bloodied child to wait on the porch for around 45 minutes until she was free to drive her home. When she did, she too was greeted by a scene of grotesque violence. When the police arrived at the scene, they immediately began questioning Brooke, and to their horror, when they asked the young girl if she had any idea who her attacker might be, she answered in the affirmative. Brooke said her great-aunt's killer looked like Uncle Clarence, a reference to Judy Johnson's 35-year-old son-in-law, Clarence Elkins. She repeated the claim on numerous occasions, even claiming that her attacker sounded like Clarence, yet years later, she admitted that she wasn't so sure. I just wasn't sure if it was Uncle Clarence or not. Brooke said, but I was too afraid to say anything. Based on her testimony, Clarence Elkins was arrested as the primary suspect in the murder of his own mother-in-law. At his trial, the state's prosecuting attorney argued that Clarence murdered his mother-in-law after her repeated interference in his marriage to her daughter, Melinda. Once again, the testimony of six-year-old Brooke was used to identify Clarence as the attacker, and prosecutors hammered the looks like him, sounds like him angle until the jury was dead set on a conviction. As a result, Clarence Elkins was convicted on a plethora of charges in June of 1999 and was sentenced to two consecutive life terms by a judge who has absolutely no prior experience with murder trials. Somehow, the jury had completely overlooked the fact that the prosecution's star witness was a six-year-old child They'd also overlooked the complete lack of forensic evidence linking Clarence to the crime scene. In fact, hairs were found on Judy's body that were determined to be the killer's. However, the prospect of them being Clarence's was completely ruled out after a DNA test came back negative. The jury also seemed to ignore the fact that Clarence had an airtight alibi. He told police that on the night of the murder, he'd been drinking with friends before returning home at around 2.30 a.m., 
something that both his friends and his wife Melinda confirmed. Given that the murder occurred between the hours of 3 a.m. and 5 a.m., this basically ruled Clarence out as the murderer. Yet the prosecution weaved such a compelling argument that the jury ignored substantial amounts of evidence in favor of a scandalous but questionable narrative. To Clarence and Melinda Elkins, it was a waking nightmare. Each knew Clarence was innocent and that a horrendous miscarriage of justice had occurred. But knowing the truth was one thing and proving it before the law was another thing entirely. Following the conviction, Clarence and Melinda began their own investigation into Judy Johnson's murder and went on to hire a private investigator by the name of Martin Yant. Martin had gained something of a reputation for assisting with the exonerations of numerous wrongfully convicted defendants, and the Elkins hoped he could do the same for Clarence. Over the course of their own private investigation, the Elkins uncovered evidence that proved beyond all doubt that Clarence was innocent of the murder. This new evidence healed the fractures in the Johnson and Elkins families, which had been bitterly divided since the day of the conviction. Three years after the original trial, Brooke Sutton filed an official statement saying that it couldn't have been Clarence. The person that hurt me and Mima had brown eyes and Clarence has blue eyes. The prosecution's prime piece of evidence was now utterly defunct, yet the families were horrified when their request for an appeal was denied. Despite the overwhelming evidence of Clarence's innocence, the presiding judge was convinced that the family's reconciliation had prompted them to coach Brooke into reversing her testimony, and on those grounds, he refused to allow a retrial. Clarence and Melinda were left shell-shocked by the development, but their determination was unwavering, and even as those around them were left despondent by the decision, the couple continued to work towards the justice they so richly deserved. Following the failed appeal, and on the advice of the private investigator Martin Yant, the Elkins commenced a lengthy legal battle that would see him win the right to access the DNA evidence recovered from the crime scene. Melinda Elkins then brought the samples to a DNA laboratory in Texas who tested them out at half their normal asking price of $25,000. These tests conclusively excluded Clarence from the crime scene, as not a single strand recovered from the scene matched his own. However, in another nauseating bureaucratic blunder, Judge Judy Hunter ruled that because a jury convicted him without DNA evidence, they would have convicted him even if it didn't match. Essentially, Clarence would only be exonerated if the actual killer was identified and apprehended. For all intents and purposes, Melinda Elkins has been given a task that no one should have to undertake. She was faced with solving the murder of her own mother. Many others might find it a task too grim to bear, but Melinda Elkins was resolute. She knew in her heart of hearts that her husband was innocent and that their perseverance would one day pay off. Besides, it was now not simply a case of clearing Clarence's name, she had to find the monster that murdered her mother. Melinda visited her initial investigation into the murder, re-questioning Brooke regarding the events of that morning. It was around then that Brooke mentioned her interaction with Tanya Brazel, the neighbor whose home she'd wandered up to in her grief-stricken days. Tanya had made Brooke wait on the porch for almost 45 minutes before finally driving her home, and this is after the little girl had made it clear that there had been a murder. Tanya's excuse was that she had to finish cooking breakfast for her kids, and that there was no point in just dropping everything if Judy Johnson was beyond saving. This obviously threw a giant red flag for Melinda Elkins, who was determined to get to the bottom of why Tanya was so seemingly unshaken by the arrival of a bruised and bloodied six-year-old on her doorstep. Melinda discovered that despite Tanya living alone with her three children, she had a common-law marriage with a person named Earl Mann. Born in Melbourne, Florida, Earl had a history of committing violent robberies and had previously been convicted of child abuse. Tanya apparently said that she wanted nothing to do with Earl and that she hadn't heard from him in years, but Melinda kept on digging. She eventually discovered that Earl was an ex-con and not only had been convicted of murder, but he had been released from prison just two days before her mother was killed. Melinda set about tracking Earl down, 
and learned he was incarcerated at the Mansfield Correctional Facility, about 60 miles southwest of Cleveland, the exact same prison where Clarence was serving his own sentence. Melinda promptly got in touch with her husband and issued him with a very unusual mission. He needed to steal one of Earl Mann's possessions, more specifically, something which would have his DNA on it. Clarence took his time observing Earl's habits and behaviors, and initially planned to swipe an item of his clothing from the prison laundry. But Clarence quickly noticed something about Earl, something which could well mean the answer to his prayers. Every time he was in the exercise yard, without fail, Earl smoked cigarettes. Clarence knew there was an excellent chance that Earl's saliva would leave traces of DNA on the butts of his cigarettes, but finding them among the scores of others and swiping one without raising any suspicion, that was another thing entirely. One day, out in the exercise yard, Clarence nonchalantly wandered in Earl's direction as he puffed away on his smoke. Once he was nearing the end of it, Clarence watched him like a hawk, fixated on the butt that Earl had dropped into the dirt. Then, as the convicted murderer walked away, Clarence moved into the position, then pretended to tie his shoelaces as he snatched up the still warm butt. Clarence passed the cigarette butt to the family's attorney, who in turn sent it away for testing, and the results that came back changed everything. It was a match proving once and for all that Clarence Elkins was innocent of his mother-in-law's murder. Following Earl Mann's arrest, police requestioned his common-law wife, Tanya Brazel, and were particularly interested in why she'd taken so long to respond to the traumatized young Brooke. It turned out she'd not just been busy with breakfast, because Earl Mann had been in the house that morning when Brooke came looking for help. Tanya told the police that as much as she wanted to call 911, Earl threatened her with violence if she even let Little Brooke inside the house. Tanya later claimed that the only reason she'd remain silent regarding her husband's suspicious behavior was because Brooke had named her Uncle Clarence as the killer. Yet despite arguably being an accessory to murder, Tanya was never charged with any crime. Unbelievably, even in the face of compelling DNA evidence, the local district attorney refused to release Clarence Elkins from prison. A press conference was held, with high-ranking law enforcement officials lambasting the terrible miscarriage of justice. Media coverage continued to generate public outrage, until finally, on December 15th of 2005, Clarence Elkins was officially declared innocent before being released from prison shortly afterward. Three years later, Earl Mann pled guilty to charges of aggravated murder in the death of Judy Johnson. He was sentenced to 55 years to life in prison and will not be eligible for parole until he's 92 years old. Clarence Elkins received compensation from the state of Ohio to the tune of just over a million dollars, but later sued the local Barberton Police Department, securing an additional five million in restitution. Sadly, his marriage to Melinda didn't survive their ordeal, and they divorced in September of 2006 less than a year after his release. However, it should be noted that the split was a very amicable one, and that the pair remain close friends to this day. Frankly, it's a miracle that they stayed together at all after one was accused of killing the other's mother, and the fact that Melinda basically solved her own mother's murder is a testament to her strength of character. We can only hope that both Melinda and Clarence have found the peace and the justice that they've so richly deserved. Born in Chicago on August 25th of 1965, Mia Catherine Zapata showed a passion for music from a very early age. Originally influenced by jazz and R&B singers such as Billie Holiday, Ray Charles, and Sam Cooke, Mia would go on to be possessed by a very different kind of music punk rock. In 1984, Mia enrolled at a liberal arts college in Yellow Springs, Ohio, and it's here that she and three of her close friends started a band they called The Gits. Within no time, The Gits had developed a loyal following amidst the local underground punk scene. 
and the band saw such success that they decided to pursue their musical ambitions full time. In late 1989, the Gits relocated to Seattle, Washington to engage in the city's burgeoning grunge scene, with fellow musicians saying that their approach warranted immediate respect and interest. Mia herself was described as an extraordinarily vibrant and talented girl who had a way of bringing people of different interests and backgrounds together. For a while, it seemed as though the Gits were destined for great things, as their music had drawn the interest of grunge titans such as Soundgarden and Pearl Jam. But their dreams were violently cut short one night, in an incident that would send shockwaves through the Pacific Northwest, as well as the wider musical community. On the night of July 7th, 1993, Mia had been drinking at the Comet Tavern in Seattle's Capitol Hill neighborhood. She had been renting a studio apartment in the basement of a nearby tenement building, and the Comet was just a block away, so after stumbling back home, she briefly stopped in to see a friend who lived up on the second floor. This was the last time she was ever seen alive. A few hours later, Mia's body was found near the intersection of 24th Avenue and South Washington Street in Seattle's Central District. She had been beaten, violated, and strangled, with her time of death said to be around 2.15 a.m. Since she had no ID on her at the time, EMTs had no idea who she was. It was only when being examined by the coroner that Mia was recognized, and that was only down to him being a huge fan of her work. The coroner had actually been to see the Gits in concert just a few months prior. Then there was Mia, lying on an autopsy table, cold to the touch. Mia's murder stunned the Seattle musical community, with some saying that an overarching atmosphere of fear and defeat lingered following her death. The Seattle Times was quoted as saying that the Seattle scene has lost its sense of invincibility, with one reporter calling the incident a reality check. We were all really strong, outspoken, hard-hitting women and we refused to see ourselves as victims, a close friend told the media but I think Mia's death shattered that myth of invincibility for us. It showed us that these things happen to all types of women. Others describe her as a kind of feminist martyr, stating that she became this icon of feminism in all kinds of things, like she was a riot girl before riot girls were even a thing. Grunge trio Nirvana was so affected by the incident that they helped raise $70,000 to fund a private investigation that would span the next three years. When the funds dried up, most expected the head PI, Lee Heeren, to simply give up the ghost. But she too had become so attached to Mia's story that she continued to investigate free of charge. Yet in 1998, after five years of intensive police and private investigation, one police detective was quoted as saying, we're no closer to solving the case than we were right after the murder. Mia's fans and loved ones would have to wait 20 years for a solid break in the case, and that break came in 2003, when Florida fisherman Jesus Mesquia was arrested and charged based on corroborating DNA evidence. Mesquia had a history of violence towards women, including incidents of domestic abuse burglary, assault, and battery. All of his ex-girlfriends, including his wife at the time of his arrest, had filed reports against him. There was also a report of indecent exposure on file against him in Seattle within two weeks of Mia Zapata's murder. The only problem homicide detectives faced was that there was no known prior link between Mesquia and Mia. Yet unlike the decades before, detectives had a relatively new tool at their disposal. DNA evidence. A DNA profile was extracted using traces of saliva found in the bite marks of Mia's body. This biological profile was then kept in cold storage until the proper technology was developed for full extraction and analysis. The original 2001 entry failed to generate a positive result, but Ms. Kia's DNA was entered into the national CODIS database after he was arrested in Florida on burglary and domestic abuse charges in 2002. At his trial, Ms. Kia maintained his innocence, stating he was nowhere near Seattle on the evening in question, 
but DNA evidence was irrefutable, and it was argued that there was only a 1 in 100 million chance that Mia's attacker had an identical DNA profile to Jesus Mesquia. The prosecution argued that the attack was one of pure opportunity, that Jesus had spotted Mia leaving the bar visibly intoxicated and had decided on a spur-of-the-moment attack. Since Mia was wearing a pair of headphones, she was completely unaware that she was being crept up on until it was too late, and it's likely that she was in the back of Mesquia's vehicle before she even knew what was happening. After assaulting and murdering her, Jesus simply dumped Mia's body at the side of the road, then proceeded to flee the area. On the back of the prosecution's DNA evidence and the defendant's extensive criminal history, Jesus Mesquia was found guilty of Mia's murder in 2004 and was sentenced to 30 years imprisonment. He would eventually pass away in a Washington State hospital on January 21st of 2021 at the age of 66 years old. Mia, on the other hand, is interred at the Cave Hill Cemetery in her adopted hometown of Louisville, Kentucky. And he, he grave his he grave. And he, Mia, on the other hand, is interred at the Cave Hill Cemetery in her adopted hometown of Louisville, Kentucky. And her grave is still frequented by fans of the Gits, as well as those touched by her wider legacy. In the aftermath of Mia's murder. Friends and fans founded a self-defense group they called Home Alive. Home Alive was a female-focused charity that offered a range of courses from basic urban safety to the use of pepper spray and the application of martial arts, the idea being to teach women and girls how to not only defend themselves, but avoid dangerous situations in the first place. Home Alive raised funds through benefit concerts as well as through the financial contributions of a wide variety of musical acts including Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, and Heart. And all those that passed through the program were reminded of Mia, and how her death would inspire others to defend their lives and freedoms from those who'd wish to take them away. But there is one person we should remember regarding Mia's case, and that's Lee Heeren the private investigator who continued to work her case long after the funding had run out. It was Lee who pushed for DNA evidence to be collected and stored, and it was Lee who insists on retesting the DNA after the initial failure to match. Essentially, if it wasn't for the empathy and generosity of one plucky private investigator, Mia Zapata's killer might well have gone unpunished. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, don't forget to grab your sleeping jeans. <laughs>